Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation with Steve McCurry. It's a great honor to have this legendary photographer with us. Steve has been one of the most iconic figures in contemporary photography for more than four decades. He has won most every prestigious award in the industry, including the Robert Kappa Gold Medal, the National Press Pr Photographer's Award, and an unprecedented four first prize awards from the World Press Photo Contest. In 2019, he was inducted into the International Photography Hall of Fame. We only have to look at Steve's sheer volume of photos from across the globe to realize that he's in perpetual motion. He travels the world for his photographic projects, covering areas of international and civil conflicts and documenting ancient traditions, as well as vanishing and contemporary cultures. His exquisite use of color and commitment to retain the human element has made his images timeless and captivating. All of Steve's photographs are a testament to a fascinating life behind the lens and colossal artistic and technical achievement. So most importantly, there is a profound sense of humanity in every photo he takes. He has an ability to capture his subject on their own terms in the most compassionate manner. He walks in his subject's shoes and tells their compelling story one frame at a time. Steve's work has been the subject of numerous museum exhibitions and scores of books. His very newest book, in Search of Elsewhere, Unseen Images is just being released and is available on Amazon. This is the book, uh, if you can see it, and if you get a chance, uh, you should get it. Um, it's a stunning volume of color images that have never been published before. I'm thrilled that we are having this conversation in conjunction with the launch of this uh, beautiful new book. So I've read that Steve travels 95% of the time off into remote corners of the world. So we are particularly lucky to have him here with us today. I'm going to ask Steve to talk about his life, his work, and what has made him the household name that he is. But um, before we start, um, I, would want, I want to share some images of his remarkable work to set the tone. If you're in New York City, you can see these works in our Madison Avenue Gallery. And so Ben, if you would be kind enough to start the slideshow.
So welcome, Steve. It's great to be with you. Great to Thank see you. you. I think last time I saw you was in Singapore, right? Or was it New That's York? Right, yeah. Yeah, I think it was in Singapore. A few years ago. Warm, warm and beautiful. Uh, uh, here we are in uh, East Coast under this COVID-19, uh, you know, situation. So, <laughs> so how does it feel to be in um, one place as opposed to traveling constantly? Well, you know, I... I been traveling sometimes six, nine months a year, sometimes 10, 11. Uh, and it's now suddenly I um, haven't traveled anywhere since uh, March. Um, and it's strange, although I have to say I've kind of starting to enjoy uh, being able to have a kind of a more of a sedentary routine. I'm still working in my studio, but um, to be able to kind of go back home at the same time and have dinner and um, do sort of ordinary things that other people, you know, ordinary life. Uh, it's refreshing and it's interesting. I wish I had actually two lives, one to kind of continue uh, doing this, but also, uh, you know, continue to travel after this um, cloud has kind of lifted. But uh, it's, it's strange. Uh, I have to say though, what I, what I don't miss are things like airport security and customs and immigration <laughs> and uh, you know all that stuff you know connected to traveling is I no way, I'm so happy not to have to do that now. Yeah, kind of we are living a medieval life. Wherever we can walk, we tend to go there. You know exactly. Yeah. The constant traveling has changed, right? Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> it's changed all of our lives. So. Um, so I want to start, actually, a lot of our supporters were asking me about your life, early life. So I want to start with a kind of a biographical question. And you come from an upper middle class background and you grew up in Philadelphia. I've read you had a rebellious adolescence, correct? <laughs> <laughs> and you got oh, into class and at that point you didn't care much about school and started traveling at a very early age. You, I guess you were blazing your own path from the start. At a young age, you started traveling to Europe and Africa. Tell us a little bit about your early life in Philadelphia and why you began to travel at that early age and why. Well, well I, was, I was very restless and I, I wanted to, um, I was inter interested in school. I wanted to be with my friends and, you know, I, you know all the kind of, uh, get, you know, we were, um, uh, girls and cars and all that so stuff and that back in the 60s. Um, then I started, I worked in a company. I worked in the international vision of, of a company and I started meeting all these people from different parts of the world, Africa, Asia, Europe. And I started becoming very curious about other countries and other regions. And I decided, well, you know, I want to go see these places for myself. So I got a Went to, I went to Europe and lived in Europe for a year. Uh, worked in kind of odd jobs. I lived with some families and lived in, you know, different places. Went, went to, um, uh, drove across Eastern Europe to Turkey. Um, and and I, then I really sort of got that travel bug. And I thought, you know, whatever I do in my life, whatever profession I, I, I get, I, I want to travel to be part of it. And um, so I went back to, you know, college, studied, looking for something to learn and something to, and so I thought, well, why not uh, filmmaking, cinematography would be great fun. And I, I've always had a kind of creative bent and kind of creative energy. And then in the middle of studying film, I, I kind of stumbled across still photography. I took a class in still photography and, and then I was sort of completely smitten. And I decided that uh, th this, was really my calling, uh, getting this small camera, uh, walking out on the street, being able to photograph whatever I, you know, being curious. And it was, it was so much more effortless and more spontaneous than in filmmaking. Uh, it was a lot less expensive. The camera was much more easier to hold. Um, and it didn't require any pre-production or post-production. It was just literally the kind of finding that serendipitous moment. So I got a job uh, on a newspaper and which was 
kind of boring and I thought I got to save my money and I got to really do something daring and do something really different. So I, I saved money, got a one-way ticket and I went to, to India. I, I chose India because I, as I'd, I'd already spent some time in Europe, I went to Africa um, while I was in college. And when was and this? I, and I thought, at, at that time, you know, China and, 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 and the Soviet Union were very difficult to get into and to work. India, with its diversity of regions and cultures and religions, uh, was just uh, you know so rich, so visually and culturally rich. So I went there, and I, I just you know that that six week trip turned into two years. I, I literally got there, and I was just uh, kind of blown away. I, I wanted to go everywhere and see everything. I I, I, I kind of experienced two monsoons which were incredible. I, I was driving the train. Uh, I was up in the Himalayas. I was down in the desert in, in, in Rajasthan. And it was just like, so, so I had so much depth. And so I decided that, you know, this was uh, kind of my, uh, you know, and, and I just kind of kept going back. And here I am like 35 years later, <laughs> still, uh, you know, being fascinated and still wanting to go back and learn more about not only kind of the South Asia, but other regions. You know, I spent a lot of time in in, in China and Russia, South America. And uh, it's always, you know, fascinating to see how people are, yet we're all different, different languages, different cultures, but kind of fundamentally, we're all kind of the same that we had the shared humanity. And, uh, you know, you're Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist or Christian or, or whatever, Sikh or Parsi or, but we all had this co commonality. Uh, we all, you know, love our families. We will all uh, look forward to the weekend to spend it with friends and whatnot. And uh, so once you go to a place that you've read about or a place like Afghanistan it seems so kind of scary and uh, you get there and you realize that, wow, this is like a really normal place. <laughs> and there's, you know, there's all these kind of really wonderful people that are you know, hospitable and, and, and you realize that it's, you kind of dig down deep and you realize this is a, a really uh, interesting place and you wanna kind of uh, you know, spend more time. And, and then you think, well, wait a minute, everything I've read about and seen on television about the Taliban and, and terrorism. Uh, it, it, of course, that's there, but there's a whole separate, you know, the 95% of the other part of the country is really kind of fascinating and interesting. So um, you mentioned you had been to India and went there for two years. And after India, you went to, you slipped into Pakistan, then into uh, Afghanistan at the time the Soviet Union had invaded uh, the country and you wore Afghani dress and you managed to slip into, we we'll saw some photographs of that. Um, tell us what was Afghanistan like then and through your images, the world got to know about the Soviet invasion, right? And suddenly you become extremely sort of important in that context. And what was it like to gain that fame and that early part of your life? And um, yeah, we would, we would like to know um, more, more about that. Well, I, I um, was, when I was in India, I, I took one summer and uh, crossed the border into Pakistan and went up into this area in the Hindu Kush, a town called Chitral. And I was in this really kind of cheap hotel and I met two Afghan refugees uh, just by chance. And they said, oh, this, this war is raging in our country. That, that, it was only a short walk across the mountain in Afghanistan. So they said that, you know, we've had to flee. Our villages have been destroyed. Uh, you know, you're a photographer. We'd like to invite you to come in and see what's going on and, and photograph and tell the world our story. And I, I, I kind of was hesitant, but I, on the other hand, I was young, I was adventurous. I, this was an incredible story. You know, I didn't really know who these, these guys were, 
and I didn't really have any reason to trust them, but I decided that, you know, I, I would go ahead and take them up on their offer. So we, we, we had to go in illegally. We had to cross the border uh, secretly through the mountains. So I, I put on this sort of traditional shawar kameez. I shaved my head. I dyed my beard black. I put my cameras into this sort of burlap sack and threw it on my shoulder. We, we walked right past uh, a Pakistani army outpost and they were inspecting everybody that was coming and going and they, they didn't recognize me as being a foreigner. <laughs> I, I was all kind of dirty and everything. I looked like a farmer who had just come out of the, out of the field. Um, and I went into Afghanistan and, and, and it, was, it was true that a lot of the villages that we passed through were completely destroyed, no people, uh, and it, it kept seeing these vill village after village. And um, I, I just got kind of hooked on the story. Uh, I, I really had a, started meeting people, became friends with uh, different villagers. And um, they were so hospitable and so friendly and, and so kind of innocent. Uh, the, the central government was trying to impose certain new rules and which they viewed as uh, you know, anti-Islamic and that they saw their way of life sort of being uh, threatened. And uh, so they were the farmers and shepherds, they were taking up arms. I mean, their, their weapons were these old kind of Enfield rifles. And, uh, but they were, uh, you know, convinced that they had to defend their kind of family and their way of life. And I, I stayed a couple of weeks and I, uh, oh, oh <laughs> When I was leaving Afghanistan, I got very paranoid and very nervous that I might get stopped uh, by the, you know, the, the immigration. Border security. Yeah, and uh, they would uh, frisk me and confiscate all my film and cameras. So I decided to take some time and kind of sew some of my exposed film into my clothing. Uh, and if I, you know, the film that they would take would hopefully be just the fit rolls in my camera bag and my camera and that the ones with the exposed film wouldn't get taken. So that that actually, I never got stopped, but I was prepared for anything. And I got I, I got into Pakistan. I took a bus to, to the border at Lahore and then walked across the border, took a train to, uh, from Amritsar to Delhi and then Ship my film back to back home and had it processed. And, and it, these were pictures that people didn't really know the story. And uh, apart from a couple other photographers, these were the first images uh, of that conflict. And about six months later, the Soviet Union invaded. And then it became this like, that was the biggest story uh, of, of the time. And um, I had all these pictures ready, already made, uh, and I was being published in you know the New York Times and Parry Match and and all the newspapers and magazines all over the world. Uh, so I kind of went from this sort of unknown uh, newspaper photographer, freelance photographer from Philadelphia, to having my pictures published all over the world, and I started getting uh, kind of major assignments. Uh, but, you know, I, there were several years of hard work that went into all of that. So I was very grateful for the recognition. And uh, I, uh, I thought, you know, now I have to, now I have to do the best I can to continue to cover this story. So I went back to Afghanistan like 30 times uh, on various projects and assignments. Um, and then started kind of going to other countries too. But I, I really uh, had a very deep archive uh, and experience in Afghanistan. It, it was really dangerous back in uh, those uh, in, in the eighties, all the way up until the last. I, I was there four years ago, but um, you know, I, I never thought of myself. I, I never considered myself a war photographer. I was always interested in the human 
element that the story of the refugees and people who were caught in the middle of this, these armed conflicts. But a lot of times when you're photographing, you know, refugees, you know, fleeing for their lives, you, you get caught up in, in those combat situations and you find yourself, you know, with, you know, mortar rounds and artillery and <laughs> bombs falling around. It's, it's really quite frightening, but uh, uh, I, I never wanted to be in that kind of warfare situation, but um, it just kind of happened. So obviously, uh, Afghanistan has been so pivotal to your career. So it was also in Afghanistan that you encountered the green-eyed uh, Afghan girl. It's become the most recognized photograph of the 20th century. And it's been compared to the Mona Lisa, <laughs> uh, to her because of her enigmatic smile, right? Uh, so you famously okay. tracked down the Afghani girl many years later for a documentary. Right? And uh, so can you tell us uh, when you met her, um, the method of photographing her, what was the process? And then, um, and did you know at that time that this photograph will become so important? And um, yeah, that's like to know about that. Well, I was photographing the Afghan refugee situation up and down the border with Pakistan. I, I went to dozens and dozens of refugee camps. Uh, it was always the same story. You know, uh, you, you can't photograph the women um, but you could photograph children. Uh, Afghan, uh, Afghans are very happy to have you photograph their sons and daughters up until puberty. Uh, I was in, so I was in this refugee camp one morning outside of Peshawar and I, I walked past this uh, school for, for girls and I heard voices coming through the tent. Uh, and I walked in and I asked the teacher if I could uh, had permission to photograph the class. I had a uh, permit from the camp. And um, as soon as I walked in and, and kind of surveyed the situation, I saw this one girl with this incredible uh, look and these incredible eyes and, and kind of suddenly <laughs> everything kind of disappeared. And, and the only thing I could see and think about was this remarkable face and, and this look on this little girl. And so I, I, I started photographing the class and the, the students and the teacher. And uh, I eventually came around to asking the teacher, you know, can I, could you ask this girl, this little girl, if I could photograph her too? And so uh, she agreed and, and sat in front of my camera. And I, I, I it was one of those cases where it, it was, everything was, was perfect. I mean, it never happens, but in this case, the, the light was right, the, the background was, was right, the right color against her, what she was wearing. Um, you know, her, her expression was ambiguous. It, it, she wasn't kind of uh, uh, smiling, but she wasn't frowning. It was, and, uh, she had, uh, her face was a little bit, you know, had some dirt on her face, her shawl was ripped. And I literally just, she sat down, I, I made, uh, I don't know, several frames. Uh, and then after a, a couple of minutes, she, she just got up and left. She just got up and figured <laughs> that was it. Um, and I, I always thought that part of the, her look it was a combination, I think, of her being uh, a refugee, of course, being a, an orphan, uh, but also I think there was a, a little bit of curiosity about looking at me and wondering, like, who was this strange man uh, dressed in a funny way with his camera, and what's he doing, and why is he here? And um, we couldn't, I didn't speak her language. Uh, so th this incredible, uh, all these elements came together and and I this picture happened, which is I kind of think once in a, a lifetime shot. It's the kind of picture. I, I remember there was a funny situation where um, an editor for a magazine sent out a note to his his photographer saying, you know, we want to we want we want you to make that picture for us. <laughs> As though you could kind of manufacture that picture. It was it was uh 
so so it was about two months from uh, from exposing that roll of film to actually seeing the results. And after I finished in the tent that morning, went back to my hotel and had lunch and kind of forgot about it. Um, I, I remember thinking as I was sh photographing, you know, that, you know, I, and I hope this is in focus. I hope that, you know, there's no camera movement or camera shaking because I was at a very slow shutter speed. And, uh, but then I kind of, you know, so fast forward two months, I got back and I saw the pictures, they were sharp and, uh, and it had this power, this, this incredible light on her face and this expression, which was really magical. Uh, and it ended up, uh, you know, ended up being on the covers of books and magazines and, and, and people, you know, the, the, the real test I think of that picture is that uh, Afghans uh, are, are very, uh, they love that picture that they really, uh, they, they, they think that uh, it really represents Afghan people, Afghan refugees in a very dignified and respectful way. I, I, I've had Afghan taxi drivers in both New York and Washington. We got to talking about Afghanistan. We talked about you know neighborhoods and where they were from. I knew people that they knew. And at the end of the ride, once they found out I had made that picture, they refused to take the the the, the you know the the the, the fare. <laughs> and I had to fight with them to you know no you have you know I insist that you take the money for the thing because they were so uh, happy that that somebody had photographed uh, you know, a, a little girl who's poor, who's obviously, you know, had terrible things happen to her, yet she has this real determination, this fortitude, this resilience, and this, you know, this look that, you know, we're gonna persevere, we're gonna go forward against all odds. So, <laughs> yeah. So what was it like meeting her, what, many, uh, Several years, was 17 yeah, years? 17 years later. Did you want to make a documentary film? Uh, well, we, we, we found her. It was a miracle. How did you find her? Well, we, 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 we found the school where I had originally photographed her, and we were able to find the teacher who had been retired, but we were able to find the teacher, and that kind of got the ball rolling. Uh, we, we showed the picture to, to like you know, hundreds of people, and eventually um, we found a person who knew where her brother was living. But, you know, to try and find a woman in Afghanistan is like, forget it, impossible. Because she's potentially in a village, you know, miles inside Afghanistan, maybe you have to walk there. She's in Perda, she can't be seen by, even if you found her, to have the family agree to let you photograph her is an impossibility. And we got, the, the lucky part was that her husband, who has the, most of the decision, had kind of grown up in Peshawar. He, he was more urban, more kind of uh, modern thinking, and uh, partly saw that there was an opportunity for them uh, to have a better life and whatnot. So he agreed to let her, his wife, uh, be photographed. And it was literally, I mean, I've spent years in Afghanistan and it's such a unlikely, impossible thing to think that you can have that happen, but it, it did happen, it was amazing. So I read somewhere that you bought her a house. Uh, yeah, my sister <laughs> went over with like, I, I can't remember if she took it in cash or had it wired by Western Union, it was like 60, $70,000. And we uh, bought this house for her in her name, uh, which again, uh, generally property is um, in the in the in the in the man's name. But uh, yeah, we thought that you know, we we wanted to you know after having such a difficult life, uh, try and do something to you know compensate her for you know the use of the picture and and but also we you know we 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 were helping her and still continue to do so uh, like every month. Uh, so yeah, it's been an ongoing uh, relationship.
So before we move to another question, uh, I want to ask you, how did you track her down? How did you know it was the same girl? And uh, then when you did encounter her, was she, you identified her, did she go through hard times or was she? Uh, how well, she, was she, she, she had gotten married. She had uh, some children. Um, the reason we were, I, I was 100% convinced uh, that it was her was for two, she has a scar, a very prominent scar on her nose. If you look at the picture, you can see a scar. And um, when I saw her and saw that same scar there, I, I was thought 100%. But on top of that, uh, we took her to a, an optometrist in Peshawar who, uh, and then we did a retinal scan and, and you know, the, if you see the documentary, uh, there's some scientists who got in the game and realized that there was a, you know, one in a billion chance that it wouldn't be her. Anyway, it, it was proved, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, but it was that scar uh, that was for me the, you know, the, the conclusive. We, we met other, uh, there were a lot of other young ladies who, uh, young women who claimed to be her, but it didn't match up. The the, the, the scar well, of the well, eyes came up, and they said, "I'm this is." Yeah. So again, we we found this person who um, knew her brother, and through that we were able to find her. And she fortunately was living just over the border in Afghanistan. It was about a door to door. It was about maybe an hour and a half by bus from uh, Peshawar to her her village, and and so. Uh, she was persu persuaded to come and, and meet us. We also had a, a very respected uh, journalist helping us uh, with the translation and, and all the things. One of the most respected journalists in, in, in the country. Um, and um, so he was also helped uh, make sure that, you know, we did right for her and that everything was, you know, up you know, correct and, and, and that everybody was uh, taken care of in the best possible way. So it, it was, uh, we were so uh, grateful that, you know, she was still alive. Uh, we had gotten all these re reports over the years uh, of terrible things that may have happened, but uh, she was still alive and, and um, yeah, so there, it's, it was a, uh, and I can't, you know, people actually went and volunteered in the refugee camp uh, partly inspired by that picture. So uh, I, I thought it was a really wonderful story to help, help out her and other Afghan refugees. So um, you, you have a deep empathy for the underdog and uh, for the disinherited. So one of my favorite photo is a powerful image of a young mother, which we just showed in the slide in a red sari begging at your car. And she raises her and, and um, in your photo, she appears to be like giving a benediction. You know, there is a separation between your kind of air conditioned space and the world of heat and dust and traffic and poverty for her. But it's not, the photograph is not exploited. It's a deeply compassionate image. How do you manage to get, get these kind of photographs? What's the philosophical base that sort of- I, I think it's, uh... It's an emotional uh, connection. It, it's something which you, your heart tells you something, your gut, it, it, it's all from there. And uh, you react, um, you know, 10, 20, 30 years of experience, you start to become sort of second nature and almost on automatic pilot. I saw her at the car window and it just instantly knew that this was a powerful image. I had no time to even adjust the camera. I just raised my camera and, and then the light changed and we were in this heavy traffic. We just, we just took off. But, um, you know, you, you wonder, uh, so, so I, I had seen that image, you know, for years and that came to just, just, again, one of those moments to just comes together and you react, uh, and, and you're, uh, uh, somehow that was the image that resulted. It was uh, during the monsoon, uh, 
you know, again, you're in this traffic with this child and it's like your heart goes out to them, but it, it's, this, it's, this happens all around you all the time. And uh, you're always trying to help in some way, but I don't know, that, that was the result of that, that brief encounter, that momentary uh, encounter with that, with that woman. Um, so in that context, what's a typical day like for Steve McCurry? when you're on a road trip and how does your day begin and end? Do you do research before you arrive or do you rely on serendipity? So I, I prefer, I do a little reading before I get to a place and I kind of have a general sense, but I, I like when I get to a, a new place or even an old place, I like to spend a bit of time just walking around, uh, not really photographing initially, but just trying to get the vibe of the place, trying to understand um, the mood of the street. Um, and then slowly I sort of immerse myself. Uh, I, I always wanna just um, kind of experience the place first without the camera, without you know that kind of feel like you know, I have to get out and photograph. I just, uh, so I just, uh, you know, and then after, um, Sometime I'll get the camera. My kind of daily routine is um, I have a kind of a rough sense of where I want to go the next day, but it's not really planned uh, beyond that. So I'll, I'll go to a, a market or a, someplace, uh, I walk down a street, uh, and it's just just being open to whatever happens without really any kind of preconceived plea pre-planning uh, and I just and again it's just really out you know kind of going out for a walk and then uh, being observant uh, being curious and then just uh, waiting to see how things unfold visually and uh, but I, I don't try and put too much pressure on myself uh, I, I was thinking you know, let's just go out and enjoy the day and see how this unfolds but, you know, I get out early, I get out, I mean, in the past, I get out at six, seven o'clock in the morning on the street, uh, sometimes depending on the where I am, I'm at a sunrise, um, just to maximize the day, because sometimes like it's so bright and so hot that by, you know, nine, nine thirty in the morning, it's either too bright or too hot. Um, and then I uh, take a break in the middle of the day, and then I'll go back out again at 2.30 or 3 and then spend the rest of the day. So I, I, have a, I think it's good to have a kind of a routine. Uh, um, and, and, and yeah, that, I've always find that be uh, kind of the best way to work. Um, so tell us about your uh, favorite photographic project and what was the most dangerous if you have encountered one. Well, my most, I think my favorite project ass assignment or whatever, I think it was either, and this goes back, well, many years. Uh, it, it was, I did this, I was inspired by a New Zealand photographer named Brian Brake. He did a great essay for Life Magazine on the monsoon in, in India. Um, and then I read a book by Paul Thru about the great Indian Rail Railway Bazaar, which again, um, I thought, wow, man, this is an incredible book. Th this could be a, a kind of a photo essay. So, I, I did those two, story, two stories concurrently uh, together, uh, the monsoon and the train journey. And as I said earlier, I had lived through two monsoons and I had traveled all over the subcontinent by train. So I, I was really ready to hunker down and, and really um, photograph these two. They're, they're so rich visually. I mean, the monsoon, especially back then, uh, India was primarily an agricultural country. Uh, people, you know, drought, floods. I mean, this would life and death for some people. So it held all these incredible consequences. Uh, but then there was all this joy and relief when the rains finally came. And as I said, there's all this drama with flooding and, you know, Calcutta or Varanasi or these different Mumbai. And uh, there's all this joy with all these, you know. So it, it was rich, uh, emotionally uh, rich. Uh, and then the train, 
uh, I mean, one of the greatest ways to meet people is taking a you know a two day train trip from 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 Delhi to to what was called you know Madras, and uh, you know you're literally there like you know, and this is before um, cell phones and whatnot. You're just there, uh, and you just get these incredible conversations. <laughs> And you have hours and hours to get into all sorts of interesting things. So uh, it, it was a, so it, I, you know, I, I drove on the train, inside the train. I, sometimes I was on the roof of the train. Uh, I, I many times would sleep in the, they had these, uh, you know, rooms that you could sleep in the train station. And I, I stayed there uh, on many occasions. Uh, it, it was, it was, uh, this is, I really think that I haven't had such a great story since those two stories back in, uh, these go back many years. Um, you know, there was the Gulf War, which it was an important story uh, environmentally, um, but I have to go back to those early stories and think they were, uh, I'd like to go back and do those again. It, it was so, uh, kind of life-changing in a way. It, it really taught me a lesson, you know, if, you, if you're timid and you hold back, it, it's just not gonna happen. I remember thinking, well, maybe I can shoot this story from a small boat in, in these flooded streets in, in, uh, in Varanasi. But, well, the boat's not really working because I can't get placed. But, okay, I'm gonna get really big boots. And I finally came to the realization that the only way to do this story was to get into the water with everybody else. And, and I had to have a full commitment. And then it started to happen for me. But until I was able to have a full and utter uh, kind of committed to the story, I was, I, I, I was holding back. So it's kind of a life lesson in a way for me. And what about the dangerous side? Well, you know, Afghanistan was, and even even the the civil war in Lebanon or Cambodia during the Khmer Rouge. You know, you get there and you think, you know, what the hell, what have I gotten myself into? This is just, you know, and I, I remember uh, when bombs were raining in on us, I, I was hiding behind this wall with about 20 other Afghan fighters. And I just looked around, I, they were, were all just kind of waiting to die in the next moment because the fire was so heavy and all we could do was just hunker down. And again, I thought, I'm not a war photographer, you know, uh, it, it's not worth dying for a picture. Uh, you know, my my, what I do is photograph the human condition. I'm not inter interested in combatants and people shooting at each other. So, but that, that was something which I'll kind of never forget, never want to repeat, in fact. Okay, so um, let's talk about your technical process and expertise. Uh, tell us about your favorite camera and why. Do you use <laughs> well, the uh, digital uh, process completely? Yeah, I'm not a, much of a gearhead or I'm not much of a, uh, but I, I, I have, uh, I, I always thought that, you know, I owe it to my art and my profession to use the best equipment. Therefore, I use a, a Leica. Um, it, it's, to me, it's a dream and it's a, it's a great tool. And it, it gives, it, it really uh, it brings out the best in my, my work. Um, and I, I, I used film for, you know, 30 years. Um, but I, I'm, I have to say I'm a real fan of digital photography because it allows me to do so much more, much more uh, than, than film. I can shoot at much lower light. I can uh, evaluate composition and light and, and, and focus. I remember one of my favorite pictures uh, I made in Afghanistan. Uh, I thought, man, this is a great picture. And I got home, you know, weeks later and realized that they were all out of focus because it was so dark, I couldn't actually see the, the focus. Whereas with, with digital, you know, I could have had the opportunity to 
do a quick check with focus. And now I'm going to real, oh my God, everything's, everything's soft. Um, it's also uh, a lot, one of the worst uh, times was going through security in airports with two or 300 rolls of film and trying to convince them to do a hand inspection. That was a complete nightmare. Um, and all the chemicals and black and white developing, I don't know. I, I don't have much nostalgia for, for, for film. I, I think that today, uh, you know, digital photography is every bit, of good, every bit as good as, as, as film. I mean, maybe 20 years ago, you could have made a case uh, that film was better, but I think today it's, uh, and I, I think that uh, for me, it's more about the story in the picture and not necessarily having it like the, a beautiful print with an eight by 10 view camera, you know, using the zone system and all that. I don't, I, I think for me, it, it, I, I love the work of say Henri Cartier-Bresson and although his pictures are sometimes not totally sharp, uh, there's a kind of a raw quality, a lot of a grain but just sublime, just beautiful. And sometimes these, you know, eight by 10 view cameras by other photographers using these elaborate, you know, systems. Uh, I just don't connect with that world so much. So um, you have, a, colors are very rich. And is it a function of actually post or during is it to do with the light? Well, when I was shooting film, I would always underexpose my film by quarter of a stop, half a stop. And by doing so, you would get, everything was much more saturated. Um, so I kind of continued that kind of look um, where I like kind of dark, moody uh, pictures. Uh, and, and the colors are also kind of rich and, and moody. I, um, I just, just by sheer virtue of like uh, just darkening the picture. Um, so uh, there are times you, you know, you, you look at the pictures on the computer and you think, oh my God, it needs a bit of a contrast or darkening or lightening. And, uh, but it's so much easier to do now than, you know, burning and dodging in the, in the dark room with all those, bringing all the fixer and the, the developer and stop bath. I mean, oh my God, <laughs> I hate to think of all the chemicals I've breathed in over the years. We used to get our hands inside the trays of, chemicals and and that couldn't have been healthy you know <laughs> so um you just mentioned uh, during the conversation that your uh, trip to soviet union was prior to the invasion and the invasion came soon after that so in from my context it feels like you have an uncanny knack for being in the right place at the right time but i think it's your sister and it's a great book she wrote called in a life life in pictures and she called it like being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I guess it depends <laughs> on one's point of view, right? <laughs> you were yeah. in China, but came back to New York the night before 9-11. On the day of the attacks, you went immediately to ground zero and took amazing photos. It's like you have a sixth sense. How, how, how does this happen? I, I think it's just a virtue of spending so many years on the road and just sort of, Occasionally, you know, you you come up, uh, you know, you, you happen to be in the right place. Um, yeah, I don't. Know, I think it's just um, I don't know what it is, but I, I did get back the night before, and I remember I was down in my studio, actually not that far from Ground Zero, and uh, my studio manager got a call from her mother, like in Nebraska. She said, "You know, do you realize that the World Trade Center is on fire?" And we looked out the window and both of the towers were on fire. And so we, we immediately uh, my, got my cameras, which weren't unpacked from my trip, went up on the roof of the building and started photographing. And uh, it, it was, I remember when that first tower collapsed, it was like, my, my brain just couldn't process it. It was like I was in some kind of a, a nightmare, some, like it was unreal. And uh, shortly after the, we uh, photographed all of that and then we went down to ground zero together and uh, spent the entire day and part of the next day 
Uh, but it, it really, uh, it felt like our whole world was falling apart. And when I was down in, you know, lower Manhattan, it just, it looked like the entire lower Manhattan was, was gone. There was a lot of smoke and you couldn't see and everything was destroyed. And, and, and while I was there, another building collapsed and uh, it, it was, it just, I, I just couldn't, you know, it was like life-changing, really uh, completely traumatic. And for weeks after that, um, we could smell the fire in, 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 in our neighborhood. So it was kind of with us all the time. And for, for years, uh, I would drive into Manhattan from the airport and I would see that empty part of the skyline. And, you know, you know it was just a reminder of how devastating we all felt about that. Um, so Steve, I think uh, we have a limited amount of time. So I want to thank everyone who submitted questions for, for Steve uh, prior to this uh, conversation. And uh, we'll get to um, as many uh, questions as we can. And so apologies for, if you're not able to answer all of them, you know, overwhelming numbers actually. So I have to squint, uh, it's a very small script here. So these, this question came in from the audience. Uh, Photography is an inherently archival tradition, often gaining new or more complex meaning as time goes on and history provides context. What changes have you seen in the context or understanding of your work throughout your career? Well, that's a great question. You know, um, we've just undertaken a massive scanning project in my studio going through hundreds of thousands of, of images. And it's fascinating as we do the selection process, going back to work from uh, places which have changed so dramatically, uh, you know, the, the passage of time really starts seeing things differently and, and places which you thought would never change now ha have uh, dramatically are, are, are different. Um, so you kind of see things differently, the way people dress. Um, you know, photographing in Tibet uh, years ago, now it, it's, it's so changed and you, you just so fortunate to be able to have a record of how these people lived, how they adorned themselves, their jewelry, their makeup, the hats they wore and, and, and all, all of the, uh, the, the tents they lived in. A lot of that way of life now is is gone. So I, I never really thought of myself as a historian or uh, some kind of anthropologist, but I think that there is an element of of the work, which is a document of, of the life of, of life how how it it was, uh, never to be repeated. Um, it, that that chapter in world, you know, civilization or culture is that page has been turned. Okay, um, the second question, uh, what was the process like in selecting these images for this new project? Was there a philosophy behind the selection process? Or was it one of, was it more of an organic review of past series that led to a whole new presentation of images? Well, again, we, we wanted to go through all of my work. You know, when you're out photographing and you come back from a from a shoot, um, sometimes you make a quick edit, you go through and you pick out what you think works the best. You, you put the work aside, you go on to something else. And sometimes you, so you, you look at that work with a particular point of view, a particular mood, um, and, and you're, maybe you're looking for a particular thing, but there's all these other frames and pictures that you don't look at. So when you come back to it five, 10, 20, 30 years later, you start seeing, you look at it in a different way, a different mood, a historical difference, context or whatever. And um, I think that the, the, this new book is a reflection of what we found that had been overlooked and pictures looking at places and people, it, looking at those in a new way, 
um, and um, or you know landscapes and uh, comparing work that I may have done uh, back in the you know 70s or 80s and then looking at work I've done even last year um, and kind of comparing those seeing how they work together graphically and uh, the color palette all that okay, um... How do you view your ethical responsibilities as a photographic artist or journalist? And have you been influenced by academic critics of Western representation of the so-called Orient and Global South? Well, I think you have to photograph people as they are. Um, you don't want, you know, I, I always want to go to a place and photograph people on the street, how, how they, the, authentic way they, they dress. Um, I, I never want them to adorn themselves in, in a way they wouldn't do it if I wasn't there. Uh, so it, it has to be real pictures uh, about real people doing real things and um, pictures, places that fascinate me. Um, I, I think that the things that have fascinated me about India, suppose, uh, suppose uh, I have a lot of Indian photographer friends and I look at what, how they photograph India. And I'm not sure we're really looking at it much differently. Uh, I think the things that fascinate me about Indian culture uh, fascinate them in the same, the same way. So, and I would welcome them. And I, and I know a lot of them have come over and traveled in other parts of the world to come to the US. And I would welcome their way of looking at, at this culture with with their kind of background and, and, and their sensibilities. So um, I, I've, I, I've uh, so yeah, I think that uh, the way I've photographed uh, different cultures is my point of view. I photograph things that interest me personally and I let the chips fall where they may. If you agree with it or not, then that's, that's fine. Okay, the next question, um, at the time when you were shooting in film cameras, how long was the process of seeing your image get developed to seeing the final outcome of the image? What was your approach and anticipation in shooting with film? Well, it would take sometimes, uh, well, when I went to India, I photographed color. I didn't see the work for, for two years, actually. <laughs> uh, I thought I was making pictures in, 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 March of 1978, and I didn't see those pictures until really February of 1980. <laughs> That's a long time. Uh, normally, I would see I would be out for uh, you know six weeks, eight weeks um, before I got a chance to see the work. Um, but you always wanted to get everything right, especially when you're shooting Kodachrome which I think was the greatest film ever made. You knew that everything had to be done in camera. There was, we never heard of Photoshop, they didn't exist. We knew that everything had to be uh, done correctly at the time. The light uh, had to be right, you know, the exposure had to be exactly right. So, um, that was good training to, 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 you know, I mean, there was no, you never, you know, it couldn't fix anything in post that, 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 I, that concept didn't exist. And um, so when I, when I would do a slideshow for, for years, I would take the, the original transparency, unretouched, get a duplicate, and that would be my presentation to, you know, so there, there was no lightning or darkening was, 100% as it was, as it came out of the camera. Um, so how do you choose to take shadows and colors in a good balance making your photography? Well, I think uh, contrast, light shadows, making sure the highlights don't blow out or the, the shadows don't get blocked up. It's just a question of deciding where to shoot. I, I've always loved very muted, light uh, overcast days, cloudy days, when there's not a lot of uh, contrast. Uh, that's, I, I, I love that kind of light. Um, 
because I, I, I don't want you know the highlights to disappear. I like to be able to see into the shadows. So I think it's just a question of deciding you know where you want to shoot. You get up in the morning. Where do I want to go? Am I going to? And light is generally more even and less contrasty, you know, early in the morning and late in the afternoon, uh, as opposed to that really high contrast look, uh, say between you know ten and two. Um, so we'll take this last questions and uh, apologies if we didn't get to your question, uh, but thank you for being with us and it's been a great pleasure having Steve with us. So the last question would be, how do you choose to take, uh, sorry, how did you manage to reconcile or balance your professional and personal life during all these years? Well, for, uh... I'm doing things a little bit backwards now because I have a almost a four-year-old daughter. So I, I spent um, most of the beginning of my career on the road all the time. It was all about, you know, traveling and being away. Uh, my apartment in New York City was more like a hotel room. <laughs> and I always had my bags packed, ready to go. So now uh, this family uh, life, I'm really enjoying it sort of more towards the end of my career. Uh, but it was always about work uh, for years. That, that was my only, uh, you know, concentrate. I, I, that was the only thing that I, I cared about. Uh, so I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to take some time and do things, spend more time with, with family. And uh, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to have that experience uh, now. Okay, that was the final question. And uh, we have to thank everyone for being with us today. And uh, thank you for everyone for spending time with us. And Steve, great it's great to hear your story. We loved it. And thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Hope to see you soon. Good. Wonderful. Thanks. <laughs> Look at that handsome devil. <laughs> That's a really nice picture. <laughs> yeah, a few more, I think. A couple more. <laughs>